goes. So, Revelation 10. Uh, in my Bible, it's titled John. In my Bible, it's titled John Eats the Book. We start at verse 1 through to verse 11. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as a pillar of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up these things, which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be no time, no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was my mouth, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And may the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his most precious word. Amen. 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 So, Old Testament books referenced in this, Daniel, Exodus, Nehemiah, Ezekiel, Psalms, Zechariah, and Jeremiah. And for those who may have made a note from last week, notice the same books, the prophetic books. And we have here a break between the terrors of chapter 9 and the events that will start in chapter 11 to the end. And you may well look at chapter 10 and go, there's nothing here, nothing to see here, not worry. There are no demons, there's no beasts, just a very, very strange story of an angel standing with one foot on the earth and one on the sea, holding a small book, probably a small scroll, which John has been told to eat. There may be some who hear this later on that will recognise that imagery and wonder. There are two parts to this, but just to summarise slightly differently this chapter. Verses 1 and 2, John describes seeing an angel descending from heaven and landing with his right foot on the sea and the left on the earth and holding a little book. And the book is open. Not much there, is there? In verses 3 and 4, the angel cries out, which sounds like a lion roaring, and then you get seven thunders saying something. But strangely enough, we're not allowed to know what they are. For the first time, John isn't told to write it down. He's told not to write it down. We're not allowed to know what the seven trumpets are. And we might see why a little later. In verses 5 to 7, the angel swears by God. Now, if you remember your Old Testament, we are told not to swear by heaven above or by the things of God, and yet the angel swears by God that this is the end. When that seventh trumpet sounds, it is the end of time. 
the mysteries of God will be finished and revealed and the revelation that made by his prophets will be fully understood and fully clear. And the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. In verses 8 to 11, John is told to take the little book from the angel and eat it. And when he does this, the book is as sweet as honey in his mouth, but bitter in his belly. And finally, the angel tells John that he must prophesy. When he wakes up or he comes out of his trance, he must prophesy before many peoples and kings and nations and in many tongues. And I suspect this means different earthly languages. I don't think it's an angelic tongues. You've got to remember, John would have been a bit, in, a bit of a polyglot being a learned man. Greek would have been the first language. Greek was a, man, was a common language even spoken on the streets of Rome. Latin was the language of the uh, politicians and, and rulers. It would have been Hebrew in there, probably one or two others. Needed, even by the most common people. I want to look at the oath of the angel first. Note the manner of the oath of the angel. He lifted up his hands to heaven and swore by him that lived forever. By himself. God swearing by himself. There is a belief by some commentators that this angel is actually Jesus Christ. But normally that declares, is, is understood by when he goes, the angel of God, not an angel. And this actually says, and I saw another mighty angel come down. It doesn't use the right prefix, but I'll put it out there for you. I don't think it is Jesus Christ. But God often swears by himself. He uses himself to witness to himself. Or he uses his voice to witness to himself. And that's what he's doing now. He's telling the world what's going to happen. And the matter of the oath is that the time will end when the angel descends and the seventh trumpet sounds. Everything will be finished. Time will be no more. Everything declared in the book will be put into a speedy execution. I think it will be so speedy you won't see it coming. The mysteries of God shall all be finished. There will be no more secrets. Revelation will be fulfilled and all will be revealed. This is the one time, as far as I can tell in the Bible, in the whole of the Bible, when we have a very clear view of when the end of time will come. We don't have a day, we don't have a year, we don't have an event, but we have the word of God which says when the angel descends to claim ownership of the world, that is one foot on the sea and one foot on the earth, because that's what that's doing, he's saying I own the earth and I own all the sea, and the seventh trumpet sounds then time will be no more. Now I don't know whether when they're talking about the seventh trumpet sounds, they're talking of a spiritual trumpet, or you're going to hear a blast of noise. I really don't know, I don't have a view on that whatsoever. I think there will be a noise, but what that noise is, I don't know. But on the seventh blast of the trumpet, which is the voice of God, or an announcement to be made by God, then time will end. And we can say with confidence that when that happens, Christ is returning and the armies of heaven are in his way. What we don't have here is a when or a what, only a what. When is it a secret? God knows. God makes it very clear. No, no amount of postulating or prediction by anyone is any more than a best guess. Even Christ couldn't tell him when he's due to return. These are the mysteries of God. These are the things God decides to withhold. 
And sometimes God withholds these things by making them fully public in his word. We just don't see it. The best way to hide a tree is to plant it in a forest. The best way for God to hide a mystery is to plant it in his word so it's there for those he wants to see it, such as the prophets. But for you and me, no idea. But you see, as Christians, because Christ died for our sins and we believe that Christ died for our sins and he rose again for our justification, we trust that God has his mysteries and we leave the mysteries of God to God for him to reveal to us when he is ready to reveal to us. You see, we have nothing to fear from the mysteries of God at all. If we did, why did he send his son to die for us? The juxtaposition of that is, if we were still in our sins, and we should really be scared of sacrificing everybody we can get our hands on to get right with God. Spill all that blood. You know, we're sinners, we have to die, we have to spill blood. We don't have to do that at all. Because it's been done. As Christ said from the cross, it is finished. Now that word carried a load of weight with it. But one of the understandings of that is that this need for the sacrifice and the death of animals to cover our sins is done away with. And it's a once and for all sacrifice. It's not the blasphemy of the papist mass. It's a once and for all sacrifice. It never gets repeated. And if God was willing to do that, why should we be scared of anything that he decides to withhold from us until he's ready for us to know it? I mean, what father would give his child a serpent or an egg, for a stone for an egg? You know? This of course, of being guessing is the idea of the parable of the ten virgins as well, isn't it? You, know, you get the, the five wise and wise virgins and the, the five foolish ones and, and, and you've got this wedding feast going on. It's a lovely picture, isn't it? Wedding feast. I haven't been to a wedding for years. And you know, five of them go away and, and they fill up their lamps because in those days the wedding feast would be at night and the bridegroom would come from his house and walk to the bride's house and they would go in and have the, the big sit down. And you've got the, the fire and you've got the, the, the oil lamps and they've trimmed the wicks and they've filled it with oil. And then you've got the, the other fire that actually haven't. And they asked the first fire to give them oil. We all know the song, don't we? Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning, keep it burning. And they go off. And while they're off looking for somewhere open, they didn't have Tesco 24 hours in those days, to get the oil in their lamp, to get the wick, to actually light the way for the, for the bridegroom to turn up. He arrives. And he walks in with the five who were prepared with their oil in their lamps. And that door is shut. And it's barred from the inside. And the other five foolish virgins say, come up with their oil in their lamps. Go, let me in, let me in, I've got oil in my lamp. No. Doesn't work. Doesn't happen. They don't get in. And that's a picture of salvation. When Christ returns, for all of those who are damned, all of those who are unsaved, all of those who are destined for hell because they were not prepared, are locked out. There won't be any second chances. There will not be a, 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 a review, so to speak. Once Christ enters the house with those who are ready for him, the door is bolted. The feast starts, the marriage breakfast begins, whatever words you want to use. But for those who are not of the kingdom, there is no hope. We've had so far 2,224 years to prepare and still there are people out there that don't take it very seriously. There are out there they don't take it truly. We actually have 
churches and mainstream churches now that are even denying the Bible. But Christ will come one day and the world is in for a mighty shock. The second thing I want to look at is the strict instructions given to the Apostle. John was to take this little book and the instruction is not given by the angel who stood on the earth and sea, but told by the same voice from heaven that had told John not to write anything he had seen in the fourth verse. The angel does not does uh, the angel does tell Paul to read the book and digest or consider what he had doesn't tell him to read the book and digest or consider what he'd read. He just says eat the book. And once he'd eaten the book. The book will taste sweet in the mouth, bitter in the stomach. So what do we make of that bitter and sweet statement? It's a picture. It's a picture of the Word of God. No more, no less. It relates in some ways to what John's seen. We would all like to know the future. So, you know, it's it, it, true, we don't have to know what's going to happen tomorrow. I wouldn't mind knowing what the lottery numbers are for next week and all of that. And John's no different. See that? The sweetness is when you read the book. The sweetness is hearing the lovely story of Jesus Christ coming down as a baby to save sinners. The sweetness is the wonderful statement in John 3.16, that like God so loved the world. The sweetness is in John 4, I think it is, where he goes, everybody, Jesus, everybody can come to Christ just as they are. And Christ will turn no one away. The sweetness is God created the world and gave it over to man to look after for him. The sweetness is we're all going to heaven. All these great positive statements. So you can tell what the bitterness is going to be. Once John has digested that little book, and I suggest that little book is probably this book, and suddenly he reads and understands the qualifications in the Bible. Yes, God did send this one and only begotten Son to save us from our sins. <coughs> but you have to repent of the, you have to be repent of your sins first. You have to acknowledge who Christ is first. Yes, Jesus will never turn anybody away, no matter how bad they are. Even the, the man condemned to death in the prison can, can, can claim Christ before he's killed and he will be saved. He made a true conversion. Death fake conversions are more than likely. But only those who God sends to Christ, as it tells us in John, will Christ see. Only those who God sends to Christ will see the Christ as a saviour. And only if your conversion is honest does it have any meaning whatsoever. Yes, God made the world in seven days. And he handed it over to Adam and to Eve as, as caretakers for the land, which I think is a, a reasonable explanation of what they were supposed to be doing, looking after the bit. But he also kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden for being disobedient. He kicked them into the wilderness where they'd have to dig the land, work by the sweat of their brow to survive, and everything else that went with it. And it's from that story we get to where we are today. Yes, Revelation tells us what God is going to do in the future, maybe very soon in the future. It also tells us that lots of people are going to die. And only the saved will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the bitterness of the Bible. There's all the nice bits, the type of stuff we feed to kids. The problem is so many people never grow from being a kid, being a child, into being a fully grown person. And the church has a lot to take for that. You get so many churches that do not preach the whole gospel of salvation. They preach all the nice stuff. 
as one person I know likes to say, you know, they, they preach pink and fluffy. But that's only part of the Bible. The rest of it is a pretty harsh book. And it's harsh for our own good. It's like when you go to the doctor and they turn around and say, you, come, you have got to stop doing X, otherwise you won't get better. You have got to stop drinking, otherwise your liver will be cut. You have got to take these pills, even though they taste vile, otherwise your heart will stop working. If you put your shoes on the wrong feet, you're going to go around in circles. You know, all, all that stuff. It is sweet in the mouth. And it's bitter. John's also told that he's going to have to work. You see, he's not given this revelation to keep to himself. But he's to share it across his world before all people, all types of people, from the very top, from kings, right down to the people on the street. That's something you've forgotten. It gets hard to do when you've got less and less people to deal with. There's more to do for believers, for true believers, than there is, than there has ever been. <coughs> and yet, those who need to do the work are very, very thin on the streets. Yet John's letter in the Bible is part of that work, because the Bible has been translated into how many languages? In numbers in the hundreds. So what he was told to do by making this known to the world in between before kings, before princes, before people, before anywhere, and by many languages, we could argue, I think sensibly, because it's in the Bible, that part is done. But there's a challenge for you guys as well, and for me, that we too play our part in this. That we too are to talk to people about the glories of Christ, of being a Christian and what it means. Especially because we have this wonderful title of Boodle Protestant Dissenter Church. As opposed to Boodle Protestant Greek. You know, we are a church that stands for the word of God. Not the formal degrees. Sorry about my mouth, I We are to be brave and get out there. And yes, there's what? Half a dozen of us here. But actually, the numbers don't matter. They really don't, as long as the heart is willing. When you think about it, we are where we are because of 12 men. We are where we are because hundreds of people, after those 12 men, stood up to the persecutions of the Rome, of Rome. And I'm talking about the great persecution of Diocletian, not for the Roman Church. We are where we are. Because in the Middle Ages, people so believed that they paid attention to what was said and they passed it down to their children and their grandchildren. We are where we are because people saw the need which kicked off the Reformation for folk like you and me to be able to read the word for ourselves. We are where we are because of many brave men and women. And the question that comes out of my mouth now is, are we as brave? Are we going to leave behind us so that somebody else may stand here or in some other pulpit in 10 or 20 years' time and go, we are where we are because that small congregation in Google did X. When each of the prophecies is fulfilled, the understanding of many of the words in the Bible will become clear. It would be nice to know before the event, but it looks like we only ever get to know the four mysteries of the Ark of God, when God is ready for us to know. And the question I think needs answering, should we be concerned that there are events, images, things in the Bible we don't understand? No, I've said that before. The Hebrews, the Jews, wanted to see miracles and wonders. The Romans loved miracles and wonders. 
ancient old man back in, you know, back in the Middle Ages to have reliquaries of people's bones and things affecting miracles out of them. To be a saint in the Roman church, you actually have to be proven to have done three miracles, you know. And it has to be proven. They actually have a character in the church who is called the devil's advocate. The devil sits on the throne of St. Peter, but they have a devil's advocate, you know. But we are told to live by faith. The great letter to the Hebrews tells us to live by faith. They're not there for miracles. There are no more apostles. The time of miracles is, I don't want to say over because I don't want to limit what God can do, but they're not general anymore. We read the book of Acts, you know, you got people being blind being made to see, the dwarf, the, 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 the lame being made to walk, and all the rest of it. It may well happen nowadays, but it's not as common as it once was. But in Habakkuk 2 4, Hebrews 10 38, we get that great phrase that Luther rested on the just shall live by faith alone. By faith we are saved through grace that not of ourselves lest any man should boast. We trust and we only trust in the power of the blood of Jesus to wash away our sins and in the promise of God that all who believe in him will have eternal life. That irrespective of the evil day or the great and dreadful day, whichever you want to call it, however you wish to describe it, by that faith we know our future is secure. It was by the same faith that the martyrs of old were able to put up with the flames at Smithfield. It was by that same faith that the women were drowned up in the locks of Scotland. It was by that same faith that Nero was able to make torchlight out of the early Christian fathers. And it's that same faith which drives people in Korea, China, India, any Muslim country you care to mention, to cling to their Bible and to be willing to die just to have one in their hands. God is driving his word. Soon, oh so soon, Revelation will become more than a word in the <coughs> signs of that. We hear of wars, we hear of rumours of wars. It was interesting to read that they can expect to be in a war within the next 10 years. They are actually ramping up the military MOD forces for them now. It's the seventh trumpet about to sound. I think about six months ago we got the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But you could argue, as I did last week, that they are already out and about. Are you ready for what may come? That's the question. Are you ready? Only oh, you know the answer to that. Amen. We're going to close.